Hey friends, welcome back to the Hot Shop. My name is Davin and I'm a glass blower. Today, we're gonna make a vessel that I think is kind of quintessentially American. As a glass blower and maker of vessels, I'm always interested in sort of the history behind those vessels. The shot glass has a particularly wild history, at least apocryphally. Tons of really interesting stories, including being present in almost every single Western movie. It's sort of like a rum bottle for a pirate movie. Kind of got to put it in there, right? I also think that it is a great vessel to demonstrate one of the fundamentals of glass blowing, which is to be mostly stretch glass rather than blow it. So let's get into it. Like, subscribe, comment. Let me know if there's something else you want to see. And uh, let's go get some hot glass. Cheers. So here we go. Today we're going to try to use a little bit of history improve on the shot glass. Now everybody knows what a shot glass looks like, right? Kind of thick on the bottom, kind of chunky sides, usually it has some sort of enamel something on it. Except for that's not how they were originally made or designed. Back in the day, we're talking early 1800s, there's a proliferation of these types of glasses and they were most called whiskey glasses because that's what they were for and they didn't look anything like what we think of as a shot glass today they were described as and i've seen examples eggshell thin they had a pretty thin bottom and they were really delicate um and i imagine probably kind of nice to drink out of although i will say a shot glass as an object in itself is a pretty basic thing and it's designed to basically get something into your body as fast as possible. And this makes sense because this is pre-regulation time when unscrupulous distillers would mix pure alcohol with God knows what mysterious and often toxic things to kind of approximate whiskey or rye. And so a, a dusty, dry cowboy that wants to wash a little bit of the dust off his gullet would try to go from bar top to belly as fast as he could and the shot glass or the whiskey glass seemed an appropriate receptacle to do this job. Now why do I think it's an interesting object? Well, if you see what's happening here, it teaches us that glass blowing is more stretching than blowing. So what happened there? I got it really hot after I got it really cold. A concept you gotta wrap your mind around with glass blowing is that the thinner the glass, the easier it stretches, the easier it moves. It's kind of like a rubber band. The thinner the rubber band, the easier it stretches. The thicker the rubber band, the more difficult it stretches. Also, the thinner the glass, the faster it heats up. So what happened there was I let everything get cold. I had a bubble in that glass but I had a thick base. When I heated it up, guess what heated up faster? The thin bubble. Guess what stretched more? The thin bubble. So I stretched the length, and that's how, in roughly two moves, I can go from a blob of glass to what appears to be a shot glass. Thick base, relatively thin sides. The main difference is what we're gonna try to do today is we're gonna try to replicate some of the delicacy and finesse of those old-fashioned shot glasses that were made pre-prohibition. Prohibition, by the way, had a huge effect on um, the glass industry in America. See, the, the early whiskey glasses were hand-blown into molds, but they were hand-blown, ultra-delicate. And then they were machine-blown, again, into molds, but ultra-delicate. Oh, by the way, for those new to glass blowing, if you're wondering what's happening here, I'm flipping this around so that I can get access to the opening. So I got a little bit of blob of glass on the end of a metal rod. It's called a punty. For you glass blowers, I'm holding that neck really tightly. This only works if your neckline, your constriction is very tight and your punty is still warm when you go to break it off. Um, if everything's cold and you pick it up and bonk it like that, it'll probably break off of everything and fall on the ground. So if you're breaking something off onto a warm punty, 
you've got to get good at this move here, which is straightening the object, centering it, I should say, on the punty afterwards. So you find where it's high, lift up, find where the base is high, like right there, stop, lift up a little bit, and push the back of it on center. This is the way that I do most of my transfers and having that flexibility and that freedom um, to straighten something gives me more than one shot up, one bite at the apple. So here you go again, blowing glass, more stretching. Again, I think this is a great exercise. Every glass blower should try to make a little shot glass, thick base, ultra thin sides, because it teaches you that if you want to thin out the glass and you want to have delicacy, there's a lot of stretching involved. So anyway, back to the history. I think it's kind of interesting, all the stories that surround shot glasses, like how we get the term shot glass to begin with. There's so many stories. One of my favorite is from the cowboy era, and it was that a live cartridge cost about the same as a serving of whiskey. So a cowboy short on cash could trade a live round for a shot of whiskey. The other one is that it's, um, it was these little glasses were used to collect shot back when people hunted for themselves for their food. They used buckshot, shotguns, and sometimes some of those pellets were still in the food when they were done. And so um, what you get is some, you know, a few pellets in your mouth, you put them in the shot glass next to you. So it's a shot glass. The other story is that it is um, named after the shot glass company, spelled S-C-H-O-T or something like that. Um, still around today, by the way. But turns out none of that's probably true. More likely it was named by an old preacher back in the UK that decided that a serving of liquor should be called a shot for some reason. Again, all these are apocryphal and no one knows for sure. Oh, by the way, when you're opening something thin like this and you want it to be even thinner, open aggressively. Stretch that rim on the glass out. That's what is gonna give you that sense of delicacy and that really thin rim, which you'll see here at the end of this video. Anyway, I think this is an improvement on your standard shot glass. But honestly, that's not saying much. I mean, the reason why a shot glass is bad, no matter how well made it is, is because it's utilitarian. Drinking alcohol really shouldn't be kind of about efficiency, you know? It should be about savoring it. Taking shots of questionable liquor is no longer the purview of cowboys and prohibition drinkers. Instead, we got college kids on spring break, and they probably have the same reason to shoot as those old drinkers did. If you're drinking something questionable, it's best to go from tabletop to tonsils as fast as humanly possible. And the shot glass, well, it's a perfect delivery system for that. I'm marking this one with a skull just to remind you that when you're imbibing with a shot glass, probably more than ever, you're taking part in uh, consuming your favorite poison. Anyway, Let's take a closer look at this object here. Thick base, stamp. It holds almost exactly an ounce and a half, which is your standard jigger size, but also your standard shot glass size. The old ones, by the way, held more like two ounces, but it's got that thin, delicate rim, as you can see here. We're talking eggshell, um, wine glass then. Feels nice on the mouth when you drink out of it. Um, yeah, I think it's just a vast improvement over the, by the way, normal shot glasses that you buy nowadays, they aren't blown, they're pressed glass. And I think this is another example of how hand blown glass, while it does take longer, can make improvements on your automated machined stamped out glassware. Anyways, until we get more hot glass together, cheers.